Judges chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite residing in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But his concubine became angry with him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah, and was there some four months. Then her husband set out after her to speak tenderly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys. When he reached her father's house, the girl's father saw him and came with joy to meet him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days, so they ate and drank, and he stayed there. On the fourth day, they got up early in the morning and he prepared to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, fortify yourself with a bit of food and after that you may go. So the two men sat and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, why not spend the night and enjoy yourself? When the man got up to go, his father-in-law kept urging him until he spent the night there again. On the fifth day, he got up early in the morning to leave and the girl's father said, fortify yourself. So they lingered until the day declined and the two of them ate and drank. When the man with his concubine and his servant got up to leave, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Look, the day is worn on until it's almost evening. Spend the night. See, the day is drawn to a close. Spend the night here and enjoy yourself. Tomorrow you can get up early in the morning for your journey and go home. But the man would not spend the night. He got up and departed and arrived opposite Jebus, that is, Jerusalem. He had with him a couple of saddled donkeys, and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was far spent, and the servant said to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. But his master said to him, We'll not turn aside into a city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will continue on to Gibeah. Then he said to his servant, Come, let us try to reach one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or Ramah. So they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. He went in and sat down in the open square of the city, but no one took them in to spend the night. Then at evening, there was an old man coming from his work in the field. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was residing in Gibeah. The people of the place were Benjamites. When the old man looked up and saw the wayfarer in the open square of the city, he said, where are you going and where do you come from? He answered him, we're passing from Bethlehem and Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to my home. Nobody has offered to take me in. We, your servants, have straw and fodder for our donkeys with bread and wine for me and the woman and the young man along with us. We need nothing more. The old man said, Peace be to you. I will care for all your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. So he brought him into his house and fed the donkeys. They washed their feet and ate and drank. While they were enjoying themselves, the men of the city, a perverse lot, surrounded the house and started pounding on the door. They said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house so that we may have intercourse with him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man is my guest, do not do this vile thing. Here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Ravish them. Do whatever you want to them. But against this man, do not do such a vile thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and put her out to them. They wantonly raped her and abused her all through the night until morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. As morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. In the morning, her master got up, opened the doors of the house. When he went out to go on his way, there was his concubine lying at the door of his house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he said to her. We're going. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey and the man set out for his home. When he had entered his house, he took a knife, and grasping his concubine, he cut her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. Then he commanded the men whom he sent, saying, Thus you shall say to all the Israelites, Has such a thing ever happened since the day that the Israelites came up from the land of Egypt till this day? Consider it, take counsel, and speak out. What's gone wrong in Israel? There is an ethical value among the people of the ancient Near East that is probably the highest ethical value in their culture. The highest cultural ethical value was hospitality. Something has gone wrong in Israel because the people of Gibeah, some reason, feel that the best way to welcome a stranger is to have sex with them. Sex has become a handshake. In Gibeah. What went wrong? How did that happen? 
I want to recognize that something similar, folks, is happening in our culture. Something similar is happening. The expectation in our world, and you can see it through music, you can see it through movies, you can see it through television, you can see it through social media. The expectation is that people aren't even dating until they become sexual. Sex is a way in our culture of getting to know one another. Does that sound like Gibeah? Sex had become a handshake in Gibeah. It's a handshake for many of our children today. And there's pressure to participate in it. There's pressure to believe that if you don't participate in it, nobody will want you. You won't be good enough for anybody. You'll be thought of as a prude. You'll end your life alone. This pressure is everywhere. The title of the sermon today is The United States of Gibeah. History is repeating. So it's essential we ask the question, what went wrong in Gibeah if we are going to have any chance of knowing what might go right today? How did sexual activity become a handshake? What led them to that final ultimate conclusion where something that is so abominable that us living thousands of years later read it and we think, that's disgusting. How could anybody justify that? And yet at their time, it felt perfectly reasonable. How did that happen? The broader narrative of judges and this particular story are going to help us to identify the ways in which these kinds of distorted thinking snuck into the culture of Israel. Over the next two weeks, we're going to discuss how this culture in Gibeah and how ours is responding to stress, how it's responding to a need for intimacy, and how it's responding to a need to protect itself. Stress, intimacy, and self-protection. That's what we're going to talk about over these next weeks. And you'll find that evil thrives when people are stressed, when they feel alone, and when they feel threatened. And I want to begin by talking about the broader context of Judges. The bigger, the broader context of Judges describes a time in which the people were terribly stressed. It was a terrible, fearful, anxious time to be alive for the people of God. We see it in Judges chapter 19, verse 1. It was the first verse that we read. They told us again, as they've said it over and over and over again, the prophets, as they've told us these stories, there was no king in Israel. But it's finished in chapter 21, verse 25, which is the last verse of the whole book. It says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. Now we know the story of the people of Israel. We know why it went this way. They refused. Now, we might think that when the scriptures say that there was no king, that the solution then would be David or Solomon or some kind of a ruler. But I don't think that's what Judges is all about. Because when we get into Samuel and the people want a king, God is disappointed. Why would he be disappointed with their request for a king if having a king was going to solve the problem? What Judges is meaning to tell us is that there is no guiding principle. There's no external objective authority. The people are following their own consciences, their own inclinations, their own desires, their own reasoning. There's nothing outside of their groupthink to question them. And you might say, well, of course there is. God gave the law, but they don't follow it. They don't care what the law says. They're using their own instincts. And so Judges keeps telling us that because they refuse to follow God's advice in this world, God steps back and lets them have the world they've chosen. He stops advising them. He stops guiding them. He stops protecting them. And because of that, they become threatened by every enemy that looks in their direction. And these people lived in a world in which they didn't know tomorrow who might attack. They didn't know if they'd get to eat their crops this year. This is the world of the judges. It's a stressful, terrible time. And as a consequence, the Israelite people were chronically anxious. They were scared to death about the world they lived in. Here's an art, this is an article from the Association for Psychological Science entitled Stress Changes How People Make Decisions. It's by Lucy Hyde. This is a segment of the article. It's a bit surprising that stress makes people focus on the way things could go right says Mara Mather of the University of Southern California, who co-wrote the new review paper with Nicole R. Lighthall. This is sort 
of not what people would think off the bat, Mather says. Stress is usually associated with negative experiences, so you'd think maybe I'm going to be more focused on the negative outcomes. But researchers have found that when people are put under stress by being told to hold their hand in ice water for a few minutes, for example, or give a speech, they start paying more attention to positive information and discounting negative information. Stress seems to help people learn from positive feedback and impairs their learning from negative feedback, Mather says. This means when people under stress are making a difficult decision, they may pay more attention to the upsides of the alternatives they're considering and less to the downsides. So someone who's deciding whether to take a new job and is feeling stressed by the decision might weigh the increase in salary more heavily than the worst commute. And on and on and on. And without an external standard to guide us, without something outside of our own thinking to question the way we're evaluating the situation, our stress-induced optimism can lead us into terrible, terrible behavior. When we sow to the flesh and we live out of our own values and our own desires and our own thinking, we destabilize the structure of our lives and it doesn't take very much to collapse it. Israel is beginning to recognize that. They're responding to their stress in ungodly ways. And when they're stressed like that and their enemies are all around and they're terrified that they're going to be taken over, somebody's going to take my house, they're going to eat my crops, rather than going to what God had shown them would be their life, they followed their instincts. And so one of the ways that the people in the time of the judges dealt with their stress was with fleshly indulgence. Now all of us, when we're under stress, we have to cope with it. And we can see in the story of Judges some of the ways in which they were doing it. This comes from verses 1 through 15. I love this passage so much I'm not going to read it again. But you'll notice that when this Levite who had difficulty with his family, his concubine didn't like him very much, and we find out later she probably had good reason. Um, he chased her down and he wanted to bring her back, and her father doesn't want her to leave. Maybe he knows something, right? Dads tend to have an instinct. So the way he keeps the Levite there is he fills him with food, and with alcohol. He keeps him drunk and fat. And the Levite has trouble saying no to that. And everybody has trouble saying no to that when we're in a stressful time. He's in Ephraim. That's not an easy place. He lives in a remote place. He's down here. He's getting fed. So he stays longer than he wants to stay. And so he feeds his flesh, eat and drink over and over and over again. Stressful times make us feel exposed, vulnerable. What we do to cope is intended to make us feel powerful and in control. Some people use food. Some people use alcohol or drugs. Some people use violence. Some people use violent language. Whatever it takes to make me feel more in control in situations in which I feel I don't have any. We see all through the book of Judges that feasting and sex and idol worship are the go-to coping mechanisms for the Israelites in these days. Some coping mechanisms, most of them in fact, are harmful. Some coping mechanisms are healthier. What God has given to us through his law and through his guidelines, most recently through the teachings of Jesus, are coping mechanisms for stress. God authorized coping mechanisms for stress Ways in which to be centered and grounded and in control when the world is spiraling out of control. The Israelites did not believe that, and so they refused. But we might believe it. God has given us God-inspired mechanisms to cope with stress in our lives. Rituals. Do you understand what a gift it is to count days by sevens? What would it be like to have no end to the week? Just on and on and on. What if we counted by 30s? What if by 365s? The sevens give us a sense of structure and orderliness in a system that is literally not orderly. But God helps us. He says you need to categorize your life by seven-day increments. It's going to make things easier for you. And boy, has it. He gives us rituals and patterns to follow. The sun comes up every day. Right? No matter what happens, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. He gives us liturgies. 
I don't know what to say. I don't know what to speak about this terrible stuff I'm enduring. And he gives us the Psalms so we can read them and we begin to learn the language of lament and complaint or, or praise and celebration or repentance. He gives us patterns so that we know how to speak our angst. Just like he gave us a week to order the days, he gives us words to order our emotions, to speak who we want to be. He gives us family. This was God's idea. A safer place in the midst of life's storms if, if it is ordered the way he wants it to be ordered. A boat. Prayer. He's promised to draw near to us. You and I might not be able to control anything in our lives, but we can speak to the one who can control anything he wants and ask his help, and he's promised to listen. That's the greatest moment of control we could ever have. When your life is spiraling out of control, you have access to the throne of grace to ask God for what you need. He's given us the community, and I know the community sometimes feels like more trouble than it's worth. But we need each other, folks. We need to hear differing opinions. We need to be supported when we go through difficult times. That's why we gather for worship. We could each worship God alone, but that's not the way he wants it done. He wants us to worship together. We need to worship him as a family, both in our home and broadly. Israel did not get this. They stopped celebrating the feast. It was a long trip to Jerusalem or to Shiloh or to wherever the ark was. And we got farms and animals. We got no one to take care of them. How can we go three times a year? That's burdensome. And so they decided it was better to stay home. Look at the world they made. God had all these rules and restrictions, but Baal didn't have all those rules and restrictions. God says you can't steal, you can't commit adultery, you can't covet your neighbor's stuff, you can't lie even when it, it would work well for justice to lie under oath, you can't do any of that. But Baal didn't ask for any of that. Baal said you could have sex in the fields whenever you wanted, you could do whatever you wanted, as long as you made the right sacrifices, just live it up. Well, that's easier, so we're going to follow Baal and look at the world they made. Gibeah began to go wrong, as all Israel did in the time of the judges, because they sought to cope with the stress and difficulty of their lives by their own wits, following the inclinations of their own flesh, and following their own wisdom. Jesus reminds the people of Israel and you and I that that kind of a life leads to the kind of situation we find in Gibeah in the story we just read together. Paul, in the book of Colossians, this is in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, sex, that's sex outside of marriage is fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you've stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self. The fleshly nature is terrified of the truth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you've stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. These are curse words, some of them. Words Romans would use about minorities that they didn't much like. And he says, you've got to let go of that. Let go of Babel, folks. Don't talk about those people. Don't talk about that culture. Don't talk about how different they are than us. In Christ, there is no distinction. They are God's children. It is the flesh that makes division. It is God who brings peace. That's the, that's the coping mechanisms of the wicked, wicked. It was all over Judges. Paul could have taken the whole list from our series in Judges. Maybe he did. 
But here is the coping mechanism of the godly. Here's how the godly respond to stressful times. Here's how we can go forward when our lives are falling apart. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. Well, how do I do that, Paul? Well, be thankful. That's the next verse. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You're doing that. You're listening to the, to the word. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. Worship. Sing. Give thanks. Talk about the word. Teach the word to one another. These are the stress coping mechanisms of the faithful. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Israel was living in a bad time. And they responded by escaping it through their flesh. And eventually that will lead to the kind of thinking that goes on in Gibeah. We'll get there. There are another two points to the road. This is just the first one, but this is where it starts. God has shown you what is good for you, but it won't be easy. These are stressful times. There are financial worries. There are political worries. There are, you name it. But we know how to deal with this. We follow Jesus. We turn the other cheek. We continue to serve those who are hurting. We forgive those who sin against us. We pray for our enemies. We gather together regularly to worship. We discuss God's word day and night whenever we can. We pray and we intercede and we ask God for help. And we pray for others. And we will find peace. 